Thank you for the kind introduction. Hello, I'm Holger Peters from Leander, and I'm uh, presenting um, to you today how to use scikit-learn's uh, good, well, good interfaces for writing maintainable and testable uh, uh, machine learning code. So this talk will not really focus on the best model development or um, um, the best algorithm. It'll just show you a way how to structure your code in a way that you can test it and that you can uh, use it in a reliable way in production. Um, for some of you who might not know Scikit-Learn, Scikit-Learn is uh, probably the most well-known uh, machine learning package for Python. And um, it's, really, it's really a great package. It has all batteries included. And uh, this is its interface. All right, the problem uh, in general that, that I'm talking about is that of supervised uh, machine learning. Uh, in this talk, and just imagine um, a problem. We have, on the left side here, on the table, we have a, uh, a table with, with data. Uh, it's, it's a season, that's uh, spring, summer, fall, and uh, winter. Uh, we have a binary variable encoding whether we have a day that is a holiday or not. Each row is a data point, and each column is what we call a feature. On the right-hand side, we have some, some variable that we'll call a target. It is closely associated to the features, and the target is a variable that we would like to predict from our features. And so features are known data, targets uh, are, is the data that we want to estimate uh, from a given table on the left. In order to do this, in order to do this, uh, we actually have one data set where we have features and targets, matching features and target data, and we can use this to train a model and then have a model that predicts. So uh, the interface is as follows. We have um, a class uh, that uh, represents a, a machine learning algorithm. It has a method fit that gets, gets features named x and uh, a target array called Y, and that trains the model, so the model learns about the correlations between features and targets. And then we have uh, a method predict that can be uh, called upon the trained uh, estimator, and that um, gives us an estimate Y for the given model and the given features uh, X. And um, this is the basic problem of machine learning. There are algorithms to solve this, and I'm not going to talk about these algorithms. I rather would like to focus on how to prepare data, uh, the feature data X in this talk, and uh, how to make it in a way that is both testable, reliable, and readable to uh, software developers and data scientists. So if you, I'm sure you want to, to see how this looks like uh, in a short code snippet, and this is actually quite succinct. Um, so in this example here, we uh, generate some, some uh, data sets, X train, X test, and Y train, Y test. Um, then we uh, create a, um, a, a support vector regressor, that is our, uh, some algorithm that I take off the shelf and so I could learn. We fit the training data and we predict on the test data set and in the end we can obtain uh, a metric. We can ch um, test how well is our prediction based on uh, our input uh, features X test. And um, so this is a trained model in scikit-learn. It's very simple, very easy. And the big question now is how do we obtain or how can we uh, best prepare input data for our estimator? Because that table that I showed you might come from an SQL database or uh, from other inputs. It sometimes has to be prepared uh, for the model so we get uh, a good prediction. And you can think of this preparation in a way, it's a bit like a, some, uh, some, um, uh, preparation as it's done in, in a factory. So there are certain, certain steps that are executed to prepare this data. 
and um, you have to um, you have to cut pieces into the right shape so uh, that the algorithm can work with them. Uh, one typical preparation that we have for a lot of um, a lot of machine learning algorithms is uh, that of a, uh, a, a normal normally distributed scaling. So what we imagine that your data has uh, very high numbers and very low numbers. And, um, but your algorithm really would like to have values that are nicely distributed around uh, zero with a standard deviation uh, of one. And um, such, a, such a scaling can be easily phrased in Python code. So x is an array and um, we just uh, take the mean over all columns and subtract it from our array uh, x. So we subtract the mean of each column from each column. And then we calculate, based on this, we calculate the standard deviation and uh, divide by the standard deviation. So now each column, each column should be distributed um, around uh, a mean of zero now with a standard deviation of approximately um, one. And uh, I've prepared a small sample for this. So um, you can see above an input array uh, X, and it has two columns. Let's first focus on the rightmost column. Uh, that would be um, a feature variable with values 32, 18, and 31. Of course, in reality, we ha would have huge arrays, but for the example, a very small one is uh, sufficient. And then we apply our scaling. And in the, in the end, that column now uh, has values that are uh, based around uh, zero and are very close to zero. Um, and now I put in another problem that we have in data processing. Um, we have a missing value. So just imagine I showed you in, uh, in the first slide, I showed you an example where we have weather data. Just imagine that the thermometer that uh, measured the temperature uh, was broken on a day, so you don't have a value uh, here. But you would like that your estimation, um, you would still like an estimation for that day. And in such cases, we can, we have um, ways how to um, fill this data with values and strategies. So um, one strategy is just to replace this, not a number value, with um, the mean of this feature variable. So you could take the mean of temperatures of historic data to replace such a missing temperature slot. And um, because if you apply our uh, algorithm with the mean and dividing by the standard deviation, what you'll get is just a, uh, uh, yeah. In this example, um, you'll get a, uh, a data error from our code because not a number of values will just break uh, the mean. So uh, I've uh, prepared a bit some code that is, does a bit more than our code before. So before we just subtracted the mean and divided by the standard deviation. And um, now we would like to replace uh, not a number of values by the mean. And um, the reason our code failed before was that um, taking uh, the mean of a column that contains not a number values numerically just raises not a number. So here I replaced our uh, numpy mean function by the function numpy none mean, which will yield, even with none values in our array x, it will yield a uh, proper value for the mean. Then we can uh, subtract again, as we did before, the mean and divide by the standard deviation. And in the end, uh, we'll execute a function um, numpy non to, nu to num, which will replace all not a number values by zero. And in our rescaled data, zero is the mean of the data. So we have replaced uh, not a number values by the mean. And uh, so how does this new code transform our data? And uh, it actually seems to work pretty well. Uh, the same data example with the new code has a resulting array where both columns are distributed around zero 
with a, a small standard deviation. And um, so this is an, an example of some data pre-processing that you would apply maybe um, to your data before you feed it into the estimator. And um, yeah, this, uh, this small example actually has a few properties that are very interesting. So I said that we, um, if we go back to, to our example, we actually transform um, our um, array X and take the standard deviations of all columns and the mean of all columns um, before we call estimator.predict. But what about the next call when we call estimator.predict? There's also an array X that is feed, fed into, and we have to process data that goes into this uh, predict accordingly as we have transformed the data that goes into fit. Why is this? Because our estimator is, has learned uh, about the shapes and correlations of the data that we gave it in fit. So the data has to uh, look, um, has to have the same distributions, the same shape as the data that it saw during uh, fit. And um, how can we do this? How can we uh, make sure that the data has been transformed in the same way? And scikit-learn has a concept for this, and that's the transformer concept. Um, a transformer uh, is an object um, that has this notion of a fit and a transform step. So we can fit data, fit in a transformer, we can train it during, uh, with the method fit, and we can transform it with the method transform, and there's a shortcut defined as I could learn fit transform that does both at the same time. Um, uh, what's important about this is transform returns a modified version of our feature matrix X, uh, given a matrix X, and during the fit it has to, uh, it can also see a Y. And um, so now we can actually rephrase our code that did the uh, scaling and not number replacement in terms of such a transformer. So I called this, I wrote a little, little class, it's called a not a number guessing scalar, so because it guesses not replacement values for not numbers and it scales the data. And I implemented a method fit that has uh, that's the mean calculation as you can see, and it saves the means and the standard deviations of the columns as attributes of uh, the object itself. And then it has a method transform, and uh, transform does the actual transformation it subtracts the mean and it divides by the standard deviation and it replaces not a number values by zeros, which are zero is the mean of our transformed uh, data. And using this um, pattern, we can fit our not number guesting transformer with our training data and then transform the data that we actually would like to use for predict. We can transform it in the very same way. And another opportunity here is, since we have a nicely defined interface, and uh, for this, we can actually start testing it. And I wrote a little test for our class. Um, I think you remember our uh, example array. And I create a not number guessing scalar. I invoke fit transform to obtain a um, transformed uh, matrix. And then I start um, testing assumptions that I have about the outcome of uh, this transformation. And now uh, the issue uh, that this test actually, this, this test finds an issue. Our implementation was wrong. Because if I calculate the standard deviation for each column, and I expect the standard deviation for each column to be one, uh, I realize the, uh, that the standard deviation is not one. And uh, that has a very simple reason. If we look back at the code, um, I calculate the standard deviation of the input sample before I replace not a number values with, uh, zero, with uh, the mean. So 
um, in, in this example, uh, the standard deviation of the input sample is uh, wider than the actual distribution of the data after replacing uh, not number values with, uh, with the mean. And uh, because yeah, the mean is in the center, so, and we map not number values also to the center of the data, and that makes the distribution kind of smaller. And uh, so in a way, if we want to fix this code, we have to, we have to think about this transform method and um, the solution is actually to um, make two transformation steps. At first, we want to have one transformation step that replaces not the number values with the mean. And then we want to have a second transformation step that does the actual um, scaling of the data. So um, we want two transformations and uh, scikit-learn has a nice way to how to do this. It offers ways to compose several transformers, several transformations. Uh, in this case, we use a building block, and I apologize for the low contrast. We use building blocks um, that are called pipelines, a pipeline. And a pipeline is a sequential, is a, a, chain, a chain of transformers. And so uh, during FIT, when we, have, when we, when we uh, are training and learning from a feature matrix X, uh, we use a first transformator, transformator one, and invoke FIT transform to obtain a transformed um, version of the data and then we uh, take our second transformer, also uh, apply fit transform with the result of the first transformation, and finally we will obtain a uh, transformed data set that was transformed by several steps. It can have an arbitrary number of transformers. In the predict, when we have already learned the properties of the data, like in our example, the mean and the standard deviation, we can just uh, invoke transforms and get a transformed uh, X in the end from building a pipeline. Uh, in scikit-learn, we can build them pretty easily. There's a make pipeline function and we pass it uh, transformer objects and it will, um, it returns a pipeline object and a pipeline object itself is a transformer. That means that it has the fit and the transform method and we can just use it instead of our not a number guessing scalar that I just presented. So we could go back and rewrite this class uh, into two classes, one doing the scaling and one doing uh, the not number replacement. Um, or the question is, maybe there's actually some, someone has solved this for us already. And uh, indeed, um, Python has batteries included and scikit-learn has batteries included. So we can actually also use um, two transformers from scikit-learn's library. Uh, one of these transformers is called the imputer because it imputes uh, missing values. And um, so here, not a number would be replaced uh, by the mean. And then we have the standard scalar that uh, scales the data that is distributed in this example represented by the red distribution to one, to a data set that is distributed um, uh, around zero. And uh, these two transformers um, can be joined by a pipeline. Uh, so here you can see this. We just put together the building blocks that we already have. We saw make pipeline. We use make pipeline here and pass it a imputer instance and a send a scalar in instance. And um, then if we um, fit transform a, our example array, we can actually make sure that our assumption holds true that we would like to have a standard deviation of one. We could here also check for the means and uh, perform other tests. Um, we have wrapped the data processing with those scikit-learn transformers. And uh, we've done this in a way where we can individually test each building block. So assume that these were not present in uh, scikit-learn, we could just write them ourselves 
and the tests would be fairly easy. And um, yeah, I think that this is the biggest gain that we can have from this. So if you're leaving this talk and you want to take something away with it, something away from it, um, if you want to write maintainable, maintainable software, if you want to avoid a spaghetti code in your numeric code, try to find ways how to separate different concerns, different uh, purposes in your code into independent composable units that you can then combine and you can test them individually, you can combine them, and then you can make a test for the combined uh, model and that's uh, really a good way to uh, structure your numeric algorithms. So, uh, in the beginning I showed you an example of a machine learning um, problem where we just used a machine learning algorithm with a scikit-learn estimator that we fitted and predicted with. Uh, now, I extended this example um, with a pipeline that does the pre-processing. Make pipeline, we use the imputer, we use a standard scalar, and we can also add our estimator to this pipeline. And now our object est does contain our whole algorithmic pipeline. It does contain the pre-processing of the data and it does contain the machine learning uh, code. And also it does contain all the fitted and estimated parameters, coefficients that are uh, present in our model. So we could easily serialize this estimator object using pickle or uh, another serialization library and uh, store it to disk or send it across the world into a different uh, um, network, and then we could load it again, restore it, and make predictions from it. And um, to, so, to summarize um, what uh, scikit-learn and these interfaces can do for you, and how you should use them, um, we found that it's really beneficial to to use this these interfaces that scikit-learn provides for you. Um, if you want to write preprocessing code uh, and you can use the fit transform interface for the transformers, use them. Write your own transformers if you don't find those that you need in a library. Um, if you write your own transformers, try to separate um, concerns, separate res responsibilities. Um, estimating uh, or scaling your data has nothing to do with correcting not a number values. So don't put them into the same transformer, just write two and compose a new transformer out of the twos for, uh, for um, your model in the end. Um, if you keep your transformers and your classes small, they are a lot easier to test. And um, if tests fail, you will find the issue a lot faster if they are simple. And um, Use the features like serialization uh, because um, you can actually quality control your estimators. You can store them, you can look at them again in the future. It's really handy. And uh, in this short time, I was not able to tell you everything about the compositional and the testing things that you can do with scikit-learn. Uh, so I just wanted to give you um, an outlook on what else you could look at if you want to get into this topic. Um, there are tons of other transformers and other meta transformers that compose uh, in scikit-learn that you can uh, take a look at. For example, a feature union where you can combine different uh, transformers for feature generation and also um, estimators uh, are composable in scikit-learn. So uh, there's a cross-validation building block, the grid search in scikit-learn, that actually takes estimators and extends their functionality so uh, their predictions are cross-validated according to uh, statistical methods. Um, so I'm at the end of my talk. I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions if you like. And uh, if you also, if you want to chat with me, talk with me, you can come up to me anytime. Hi. Hi. Uh, could you 
please describe your testing environment to use a, like a, a standard library, like unit tests, something like that? To um, well, basically, we, we use unit testing uh, frameworks, um, like unit tests or PyTest. I personally prefer PyTest uh, as a test runner, and we structure our tests, or structure the tests, like we would unit test in other situations. So in a most basic form, testing numeric code is not fundamentally different than testing other code. It's, it's code, it has to be tested, you have to think of inputs and outputs, and you have to structure your code in a way that you don't have to, uh, that in most cases you don't have to do too much work to get a test running. And uh, so, yeah, we have some tools to, to generate data and uh, to get uh, more tests that are more going into the direction of integration tests. Um, but in general, um, we just use the Python tools that uh, non-data scientists also use. Other questions? Thank you for the talk. And in the test data, uh, you apply also the transformations once you have all made all the training? Yes. Um, that is, so if I understood the question correctly, the question was, uh, if we also apply the transformations to the test data, so you are talking about the data that I passed to predict, right, in the first example? Uh, not, not the one that you used for the, the training, the, the one that's uh, yeah. the test. I mean. So, uh, sorry, here, are, you're talking about... Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yes, we do, this is... This is the purpose of splitting in the transformer into those two methods. So I'll just pull up the slide again. Um, the whole purpose of splitting fit and transform here is that we can repeat, repeat this transformation in transform without having to change values for the, those estimated parameters, uh, mean and standard. If we would execute the code in fit again, then we would um, not get the same kind of data uh, into our algorithm that the algorithm expects. Any other? How do you track your model performance over time? So in, in some of our applications, we have like data going for, for years, and we have models that are built up. And then, for instance, that model, the assumptions, the underlying probabilities of the data, so we're using mostly Bayesian models, mm -hmm. um, the underlying probabilities are changing, and then we want to revalidate to see how, um, on previous data sets or versions of data sets, how the model is either overfitting or underfitting, depending on, on what we have. So are you doing anything across versions of data sets to make sure that you know, your assumptions aren't missing stuff or adding in new stuff that you have didn't have before? Okay, so um, you're asking how we actually test the stability of our uh, um, machine learning models. Yeah. Um, well, this is uh, done with cross-validation methods and um, we, um, yeah, we, we have um, for, for sample data sets, we have reference, uh, so, so um, reference scores, and if the reference scores are going, getting worse in the future, uh, then tests fail, basically. And then uh, if that happens, one has to look into, into things, uh, why, why things are getting worse. Um, there's not really, a better way than using cross-validation methods. 
Yeah, it's more of a monitoring thing. So, so this talk was more about uh, uh, actually testing testing the code, whereas your question was rather about uh, uh, testing the quality of the model. Uh, so I think these are two different concerns. Um, Yes, they, they're complementary. Yeah, definitely. So, um, I just got curious, when you do this, what do you work in? I mean, do you work in an IPython notebook or do you do it as separate scripts or what do you, what do, you do for this? Um, yeah, I'm personally not using IPython notebooks that much. I just use, uh, I write tests in test files and execute my test runner on them. And then uh, use continuous integration uh, and all the tooling that is around unit testing. Um, the, yeah, I personally, well, IPython Notebook is no environment. Uh, it's an environment that is really great at exploring things, um, but it's not a environment for test-driven development. And um, so there's no test run on IPython Notebook. And I personally think all the effort that I put into uh, thinking about some test assertion that I could type into an IPython Notebook, if I put it into a unit test. Uh, and check it into my repository. It's done continuously over and over again. So I really prefer this over uh, extensive use of IPython notebooks. I do use it if I want to quickly uh, explore something. Um, this is just an add-on, so no question. Um, your talk was about the testing stuff, and this is really great with this mo modules, let's say, or small units. Uh, but of course, it's also important to have reusability then, because then you can really yeah, change a model or apply it to different uh, problems, reusing parts of your pipeline. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.